Hi there booktube and welcome to a wrap up video. I know there's still a week of March left to go but I've read uh, six books and I wanted to get my thoughts down before uh, I forgot what I wanted to say about them with more books coming online for me in March. So let's get straight into it. And the first one is Peach by Emma Glass. Um, so this is the story of uh, a schoolgirl, uh, presumably sort of teenage, uh, who has suffered some sort of sexual assault, which we are not uh, uh, witness to. But the book opens with a sort of very graphic description of the aftermath, uh, because the girl will not tell anyone what has happened to her. She tries to cope with it herself, so she won't tell her boyfriend. She won't tell her parents, who are completely sort of uh, sex-obsessed. So she comes from a home which is very sexualized. They expect her to have a boyfriend, and they're happy for her to sort of be pregnant with a baby, because they're getting so much joy out of their their recent baby. So she feels she can't go to her parents. And the book is told in very sort of heightened, sort of lyrical language. Um, and sometimes it sort of leaps into, I mean, I'm not going to call it magical realism, but it's it's that sort of thing. So, for example, she has a teacher who's sort of known as, called Mr Custard, her, who sort of congeals in front of her into Custard. Uh, as he he senses that something's wrong with her and is trying to get her to talk. And there's the, all these sort of bits of unreality, a sort of heightened emotional state in her because she can't unload to people or she can't bring herself to unload to people. And not unsurprisingly, the effect of the assault has left her sort of looking for her, her assailant everywhere and she sees him everywhere. And the thing about him is is the smell of... Uh, and she describes him as having sausage fingers and he smells of sort of grease and fat. So when she's in a cafe... The smell of the cooking sort of, you know, sets her off and she thinks he, she sees him at the window, that, that sort of thing. Um, and she, she sort of, she, her, her stomach is constantly expanding and she thinks, you know, she could be pregnant. So she gets a pregnancy test and she's not pregnant. But, you know, this is a, a sort of a theme of the book of this ex sort of constantly expanding stomach and she decides that she has to do something about all of this she won't tell anyone but she's going to turn the tables on her assailant and the guy with sausage fingers who he, she describes as a butcher she sort of turns into him by doing an act that is as bad if not worse as what as what he does and she is uh she becomes a butcher and straight after that there's a sort of big family barbecue a sort of celebration and she is a vegetarian, but she ha she eats some of the sausages, um, which I won't tell you what they're made of, um, but they are meat. Um, and it's sort of a great sort of family occasion. And woohoo, you know, she's no longer a vegetarian. She's sort of back in the realm of the norms. Um, and she thinks, you know, this is it. I've, you know, it's all it's all going to, you know, my stomach is like this because of shame and guilt and it's going to go. Uh, and the, the, the sort of the the eating of the, the sausages sort of to symbolise that. Uh, but it isn't. Her stomach continues to sort of expand and, and trouble her. And in the end, you realise why she's called Peach, because Peach is a bruisable fruit. So I'm going to leave it at that in terms of the plot. Um... The problem I had with this book was the voice. I didn't believe the voice. It felt inconsistent to me in terms of the age. So I'm going to read a, a section just to sort of illustrate what I mean by that. I want to talk, to say things to him, tell him, talk to him, say what happened last night when I was walking home. I want to say things, but I don't know how to order the words. Sentences slither around my brain. Scattered words, scatter-brained. Scatter sentences, scattered semantics, scattered seeds. Scatter my brains, grow, grow, green, grow tall. Thick knots on your chest that I touch with my fingers. Thick, not fickle. Knots fill you from the inside out. Brown knots, not hard, not wood or bone. Cartilage, inserted in your holes like cartridges. Malignant melanomas, only no, no cancer, not cancer. Knots can be removed if you please, but please don't. I like them like that. I place my hands flat. I want to climb the ridges in your skin, but how do I get in? I have put in plugs, plugged up my hole like yours, but so I don't ooze out, because I will ooze. In fact, in fact, I don't want that. And... The book is written in that heightened style all throughout, but 
it's literary and because it's literary I don't believe it comes from the mouth of a teenage girl so for example sentences slither around my brain scattered words well I can totally see her sort of saying or thinking that then we have the word play scatterbrained okay I can buy that scatter sentences scattered semantics scattered semantics is not how a, a teenage girl would would talk and I know this isn't a realist book I accept that but it just sort of feeds into this idea that I do not buy into the voice. Uh, cartilage inserted into your holes like cartridges. Malignant melanomas. Again, I just, I just didn't buy it. Um, and there were these curious leaps of sort of quite mundane scenes in a cafe or with the teacher or whatever, which were on one level. And then you had these sort of strange leaps. And the whole family barbecue scene was, was sort of very odd. And... In the end, she's, you know, she's not very sympathetic. The only sympathetic character in the whole book is the parents aren't sympathetic. The only sympathetic characters in the whole book are her boyfriend, who's very loving and tender and doesn't quite know what's going on, but still wants to support her and help her in, in, in whatever way. But uh, I did not enjoy this book at all. Uh, I would have given it one star, but the reason I've given it two stars is because, you know, it, it, it took a risk. It, 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 you know, it did something or it tried to do something with language, with form. I don't think it worked it because I don't think it was internally consistent, but I do sort of tip my hat to at least she tried. Okay, the second book, Noir, a novel by Robert Coover. Now, um, I chose this book because uh, in my never-ending quest to try and pin down the nature of, of what postmodern fiction is, because Robert Coover is sort of the... Uh, acknowledged king of the postmodern and the first book I read of his was called Lucky Pierre which didn't strike me as particularly postmodern so uh, of his other titles I bought two this is the first one of those that I've read and I bought it because you know I like sort of noir novels I'm familiar with noir style so I was interested to see what a postmodern rendition of, of that would be and on the back uh, it says so this is from Publishers Weekly, a starred review. Coover adds his dazzling two bits to the deconstructional turf Paul Oster proud in the New York trilogy. So it seems that this book is going to be a deconstruction of the noir uh, genre, even as it produces a, a work of noir fiction. So if that's the case, then yeah, that sounds kind of postmodern to me. Uh, and I like Paul Oster. I mean, the New York trilogy is fantastic. And, and that book is, is what you'd call sort of metaphysical detective story, where... It has all the trappings of a detective story, but actually the, the, the person that the detective is looking for is themselves. And there's an element of that in here, which I'll come to. So about about the book itself, I really enjoyed the way it's written. There's a lot of very good sort of word play and language. So, for example, uh, there was uh, a phrase. Um, so he's he's been in the police interrogation room uh, on many occasions, he says, and he says... Uh, I left a tooth there to cover my room and board. So, you know, that was a great sort of noirish way, you know, basically being beaten up. They knocked a tooth out, but he sort of flipped it round sort of as if, hey, yeah, you know, so what? And also uh, sundown. Is that still a thing? Hey, does the sun still come up or go down? Or is there even a sun? And that, that's, that's sort of quite illustrative because in a way, th this book is... Uh, about the city in which the action takes place it's not specified which city but it's an ever shifting city of shadows and crime and darkness and he actually says towards the end that you know the city is a is like a woman is a she he refers to it as a she and he wants to make love to it he wants to make love to the city and there's a sort of grotesque comic scene where he, he t approximates the best way of making love but to, 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 you know, to a city. But the problem with the book is, is that the case itself, which does involve humans, is uh, labyrinthine, uh, comes back on itself. Uh, he messes around with time in it. So it's not always clear as to when he's sort of putting things together that he's already, you know, investigated. Uh, and, when, and when he's in, in the actual now, the moment of now, and in a way, the case isn't that important. And there's sort of ridiculous things like virtually every night he gets knocked unconscious in the same way. You know, he gets beaten up virtually every single night and yet he never seems the worse for it. Um, so in those ways, it was quite unsatisfactory. This, the writing was enjoyable, but the story itself was, was sort of forgettable and not very involving. Um, and in a way, 
uh, it all builds up to a sort of a pun at the end. Now, uh, I described in my uh, review of Victor Pelevin's work that his novel Snuff, the whole thing builds up to a fantastic visual gag and that, you know, knock down funny. And I think this sort of does similar, but it's just the payoff isn't significant. It's not worth the build up um, to the pun that, end, that sort of ends this book. It, it is a sort of metaphysical uh, fiction in parts. You know, he's sort of uh, looking for himself. He's looking for a woman who keeps disappearing and has died. And that woman is sort of equated to the city itself. It's ever shifting. Um, so there are sort of metaphysical elements in it. But the, the first half of the book, if this is standard noir. It's, you know, I couldn't see how this was deconstructing the genre at all. I couldn't see how this was postmodern in the slightest. Um, so... I gave it three stars because it was a sort of enjoying read that sort of, you know, crackled and fizzed along. But I couldn't give it any more than that. A, because the plot was fairly uninvolving. B, because the pun at the end wasn't worth it. And I sort of knew, I'd figured out quite close to the end, admittedly, but, you know, who, who the person that he was looking for was. Um, and C, because, you know, it's not doing anything to, to the genre to deconstruct it, really. Um, I think metaphysical detective uh, fiction is not in and of itself necessarily deconstructive. It may be the the instrument by which the author wants to take the, the main character on a journey inside themselves. So, slightly disappointing, really. Three stars. OK, the next book, A Hypocritical Reader by Rosie Schneider on uh, a Dostoevsky wannabe, so an independent... Um, uh, publisher in Britain. Uh, I was excited by this because it, it sounded sort of quite, uh, I hate to use the word postmodern because <laughs> it seems an absolutely sort of degraded term, but but it was it was experimental, it was doing things. And the first three chapters, fantastic. So the first story is called A to B and it's sort of a science fiction-y, or no, not a sort of techno uh, thriller where sort of cloning, uh, digital cloning of the self has got out of hand. You know, all these uh, representations of ourselves that we have online they all sort of come back onto this character to sort of haunt her and she has to sort of fight them off with sort of old technology such as a mop stick and things like you know a mop handle and things like that but what I liked about it was that was the writing I was in Tokyo and in Tokyo I would be staying I will admit there had been some miss aims with eye screwed shut and arm correcting in shunts by and by the card enters the slots one of those sort of hotel slot keys the sucking is slow, slow. I key in the coordinates and wait. A waiter's skull propped up on greasy touch display. The machine initiates with a soothing purr. Lids flutter. Eyes roll back. Head lolls. I wait to a solemn beep. The card slid back in disapproval. I snatch it with the teeth. In the green booth light, the saliva arc is a lucent binary bubbling with zeros. I just think that's brilliant. A brilliant image. In the green booth light, the saliva arc is a lucent binary, bubbling with zeros. So I enjoyed that story. Uh, it was, I suppose, sort of being sort of techno and futurist. It was, uh, you know, experimental. Then the second story is The Interrupted Human Remains, Mr Christopher O'Rourke. So this is a metafiction story where, where reader and a uh, character in the story are sort of conversing throughout and commenting uh, throughout. So just to give you an idea of that. Um, it may please the assembled to know a little about our reader. He enjoys films, acting and the lulling oral wash of alliterative word construction. He is a graduate of a prestigious university and is, as such, in possession of a first-class degree. Mr O'Rourke has kindly acquiesced to read for us today, as well as at any time he may do so in the future, or has done in the past. It is therefore proper and just, without deference to a particular gender polemic, that further references to the reader should pre prefer the pronoun he. That is, he has finished reading the first paragraph and is about to commence with the second. These buildings are glazed with sunlight, good. The convoluted phrases of architecture cloy. Where all once stood, crumbling ivy-smocked balustrades tear the landscape. Only the rents are real. 
he hesitates here, at the author's favour for consonants, and worries that such a preference for the lyrical surface of the language may prevent him from emotionally engaging with the narrative. Thomas's eyeballs roll forwards. Floorwards. So again, you know, I really liked that and that story totally worked for me. I know that type of thing could like, really annoy readers who don't like metafiction. But, but for me, that was a really good example of metafiction because it's true. Metafiction is so uh, easy to do badly. But I think that was really well done. And then we come to the third story. I'm not going to go through them all, don't worry. This is called Mobius Strip. And it's basically the story of a relationship. So it starts off with sort of chapter five or section five, whatever, and then it sort of counts down four, three, two, one. And what it is, Mobius Strip chapter five is a relationship between a man and a woman called Tom and Rosie. And where you can't sort of see where one of them ends and the other begins because they're so in love and they're so naturally suited. They're a perfect fit for each other. But gradually, sort of four, three, two and one, they fall, their relationship falls apart uh, and, you know, she's moving out from the house. And then it comes back up to uh, two, three, four, five again and ends on sort of section five, where uh, it sort of has a terrible denouement. And again, you know, I thought this was a really interesting way to structure a story, a sort of a countdown to a breakup and then sort of counting up as, as one of the characters has to sort of, you know, rebuild and reforge a, a new life away from that relationship. And I thought that was really effective. But from there on, the book became a disappointment because it just became a series of stories about Tom and Rosie uh, in different genre styles. So there's one called The Cake Woman, where he's making a surprise life-size cake uh, in outline for her. And he has to keep it a secret, like you would any sort of birthday surprise. And she thinks he's having an affair because of his sort of suspicious behaviour. And then she discovers the cake. Um, so that's sort of slightly comic absurdist. Then we had another one called um, Summer Camp, where women go in for sort of beauty treatments, and it's sort of almost like a sort of a, a prison. So there's a sort of Stepford Wives sort of vibe to that. Uh, then there's one called The Lost Property, which is, uh, I can only describe it as an architectural story. You know, putatively, Tom has gone missing. He's sort of walked out. But then it's all about architecture, the architecture of place that she searches for him, which refers back to the metafiction story where, he, you know, he sort of says, oh, you know, architecture is cloying. And then Rosie Schneider goes and writes a story in an architectural style, which is cloying. Um, then there's a there's a story called Document about a sort of mysterious historical document, um, you know, sort of history style. And then the last one is called... Uh, post lude where the he has female genitals and the she has uh, male genitals uh and you know it's a it's a it's a consummated it consummating act between them which i just didn't think i did anything and the problem i have here is it's a bit like bolano's 2666 that to demonstrate you can write all these different genre styles shows you're a technical writer Shows you have all the technical skills, but they're pretty uninvolving. Emotionally, it's really hard to keep the level of, say, the, in this case, the first three stories, when you're just, you know, showing your technical skill. They're, they're quite uninvolving emotionally. And the, the second part of this book really dropped off, which I found sort of really disappointing. And just the other aspect of, of its sort of experimentalism. In between each of the chapters, or the sorry, the stories, is sort of fragments which sort of echo and, and do sort of loosely relate to the stories. But at the end of them, it sort of, um, it sort of hints at that thing where you choose your own way through a book. So, for example, after the story, The Lost Property, which is the architectural one, uh, this is the fragment. It's called Nine Railway Walks. Number one, this train terminates at Ponder's End and then all the rest are blank. So I suppose, you know, you're supposed to go and do, you know, walks after rail journeys yourself and fill them in. But at the bottom, this is this. I don't know if you can see this. This is this is the sort of the element of uh, you choose your own path. So I would like to die a peacefully in my sleep. Turn to page 94. B, in the heat of battle, turn to page 76. C, saving the child, turn to page 54. So if you sort of turn to those pages in the book, you'll see they, they refer to other of the fragment sections. You're never directed to an actual story, only the fragments. So that some of them start looping on themselves. So they start repeating. So, you know, if you were to follow this, and admittedly I didn't, 
you know, so you might go to, say, page 76 on the, and then realise, well, not only have you read it in order, but actually in one of the other fragments direct gave you an option and you chose page 76. So you're not really choosing your path through this book at all. It's, uh, I didn't think that worked, really. So I gave this three and a half uh, to four. I think because in Goodreads, of course, you can't have halves. I erred on the side of four because those first three stories are really strong. I really like the, the meta... Um, fictional story i like the writing in the first one set in tokyo and i love the idea of how she structured mobius strip so you know with that start of the book i thought we were onto a winner here and it did drop off significantly um but you know i think i think there's a lot in here of value so the next one jarrett kobeck if you won't read then why should i write so um what this is is a series of um, transcripted personal videos by celebrities, uh, and they, you know, it's people with video cameras in the privacy of their houses, showing how inane, how venal, how you know, obsessed with sex and drugs and all these things, how empty they are really, and Kobeck has transcripted them because. He seems to be implying we are so obsessed with celebrity culture and visual culture that nobody reads books anymore. So if you won't read, if you're too busy, you know, sort of, you know, voyeuring celebs, the lives of celebs who put their life out there on film, uh, well, then why should I write? So he hasn't. He's culled these sort of transcriptions. So this is called Paris Hilton uses a computer topless while preparing to smoke marijuana from a dragon-shaped bong with Tommy Hilfiger model Jason Shaw. So I'm going to just read a section of this. So they've got the video camera out. Paris Hilton. Mm-hmm. Let me see how nasty I look. You, I'm erasing all of that. Jason Shaw. You look so hot. Jason Shaw whispering. She looks so hot. Paris Hilton. Ow! Jason Shaw. I just squeezed her nipple. It was very exciting. Paris Hilton, I don't want to be filmed, I look nasty. Jason Shaw, mm, I love her, I love her. How about that? Yeah, yeah, boy. Paris Hilton, stop. Jason Shaw, yeah, boy, I love that. Look at that, look at that dragon. Look at the dragon, look at that nipple. Oh, shit, it's all fucking dark, you can't make it out. And just, you know, inanity after inanity after inanity. And what's, what's quite funny is a lot of these celebrities have been in trouble with the law. And so inserted are these sort of rap sheets for the celebs. So this is uh, Montana Fishburne, daughter of award-winning actor Lawrence Fishburne, blah, blah, blah. But this is her rap sheet. Criminal trespass, no contest plea. Drop charge of solicitation, drop charge of loitering in public, two years probation. 15 days of community service in lieu of 15 days in jail. $160 fine. Barred from charging money for sex. Barred from sex in public places. Barred from hitchhiking or engaging drivers anywhere in the Hollywood district. Enrolment in an AIDS education course. Submit to an AIDS test. August the 4th, 2010. Then another set of charges. Assault with a deadly weapon stroke battery stroke trespass. No contest plea. 180 days in a rehab facility. March the 1st, 2011. So, you know, this was great, basically. And then there's two inserts that are not Hollywood celebs. One is uh, the video of uh, Saddam Hussein uh, being found and dragged out of that hole and being shot. Uh, no, he was hanged. So it's the video of him being hanged that went viral. And the other one is uh, Muhammad uh, Gaddafi being dragged out of a, a drain or whatever and being shot, kicked to death and shot. And I think Kobeck sort of juxtaposes those against the celebrities, saying, you know, we almost can't, you know, it's all just visual fodder for us. It's almost as if we can't distinguish between the two. You know, so jaded and, and blunted are our sort of sensibilities. And here's, in the appendix, is a sort of spoof statistical analysis of, of, of what's gone on before. Uh, so, appendix, statistical analysis, excluding genocidal dictators. So he's only talking about the celeb ones. So, no contest, please, 11. Guilty, please, 6. Instances of being found guilty by jury, 2. Instances of being found not guilty by jury, 1. And then these sort of spurious pie charts. Distribution of prison sentences as ordered by race, uh, excluding Amy Fisher. Um, so, 
African American is the dark shade, the Caucasian is the white shade. Distribution of the person, prison time, served as ordered by public celebrity at time of sentencing, uh, excluding O.J. Simpson. So the thin uh, wedge is public celebrities, and <laughs> the black one, uh, the dark one, is pre-fame Amy Fisher. So, you know, this is great. This is very sort of satirical and, and subversive. I only gave it four because it is very slight. It's about 50 pages. You'll read it in half an hour. So... As a concept, I don't think it probably could have been any longer. So, you know, it is the right length. But it is, as enjoyable as it is, it's a bit of a morsel. So that was Gerard Kobeck. If you won't read, then why should I write? And on to The Fountain in the Forest by Tony White. Um, this is the five-star read of all of them for me. This is fantastic. So in my uh, video on the genre wars... I suggested that there's no reason why genre works can't aspire to high literary uh, values in the same way there's no reason why uh, literary fiction books can't be, you know, thrilling, gripping uh, page turners. And uh, this proves, uh, proves my point because this is a genre work. It's a detective thriller, but it has high literary values because it's doing two or three things. Which on the on the on the face of it, you could think of oh these are bolt ons these get in the way of a good story but that, but actually no because they take the story on to a whole new dimension. So basically, uh, a body is found hanging in a uh, behind the scenes in a theatre where they paint the, um, the the I suppose the it's not the scenery but the, it's not the flat made out of wood but the actual sort of more digital side of things. And uh, no one knows who this guy is. And uh, a police, because it's, uh, th this theatre workshop uh, belonged to a friend of one of the senior detectives, he can't lead the investigation, but he assists. And it's his story, effectively. Uh, he has two other sort of pressures coming down on him. One is an investigation into a, an old investigation into a death in custody, police custody, uh, where he was the senior officer. Uh, that has suddenly been uh, sort of reignited by someone sending in uh, anonymously to the police about, you know, questions about that. But there's nothing new in the accusations and yet there's no new suggestion uh, that would necessarily uh, overturn the original verdict that no, the police were not at fault. Um, but they have to go through the process of investigating that. Um and then there's another, which is sort of an, uh, an actual audit of sort of, you know, policing uh, methods and all that sort of thing, which weighs on the whole department, not just him. So he's got these other pressures. Um, and its first part is a fairly straight, uh, you know, sort of police detective investigation with sort of senior crime officers and, you know, his input and, you know, who are the, uh, the, 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 the people that are sort of uh, the main people of interest that sort of thing but stylistically uh, every chapter has the name uh, of a French revolutionary month now what do I mean by that during the French revolution because it was a revolution to sweep away uh, the aristocracy and uh, the church uh, they one of the things they attacked was the calendar and they sort of swept it away they didn't want saints days and you know the birth of Christ and the death of Christ celebrated but what you know what do they replace those those names with so they came up with uh, a list of of words that pertain to sort of you know the french rural countryside because at that stage you know most of france was you know peasant farmers so there were words like brumaire which is uh, means a sort of a mist thermidor after which the a lobster thermidor is is named so there were all these sort of words in the calendar and it's a completely revolutionary calendar which is very symbolic of the revolution you know the starting again and all the chapter headings ha are named after, you know, uh, these names. And the other thing is, is that um, Tony White, the author, uh, gives himself what are called mandated vocabulary. Now, what this is, is a set of words ran, you know, from a random source have to be used in the work. So the, uh, the random source that Tony White has chosen is the Guardian Quick Crossword from every day which is uh, Monday to Saturday, because there was no, uh, there is no Sunday Guardian, um, which he faithfully used to do. 
And he went back and sort of dug out the papers and redid them again for writing for this novel. So all the answers, all the words that are answers to these crossword clues for each day have to be used within each chapter. So you've got the revolutionary uh, calendar name, that has to be used somehow. And then you've got all these sort of random words from crossword clues. And he's done it across the course of a month. I can't remember which year he chose, but anyway. And that is the literary value because, you know, the act of being given... 20 words that you've got to fit into a chapter and still produce the plot moving forward in a coherent way. I and mean, that's quite an achievement. Um, it's not random. You know, it is saying, OK, well, I've got this detective story, but I'm going to elevate it to another level. You know, why, why is he doing that? Well, because this is ultimately a book about revolution and counter-revolution. And he's not talking about the, revolution, the French Revolution in the 17, whenever it was. He's talking about the counter-revolution and the, the attack on sort of revolutionary politics in Britain and France. So, for example, the bombing of the Rainbow Warrior, the Greenpeace uh, boat uh, in New Zealand by the French uh, secret services. You know, the Green Movement were worrying to the, the government of the day. In Britain, it was things like... Uh, sort of the free festival at Stonehenge and, and the sort of the protest against the privatisation, the corporatisation of public space. And, you know, when there were those protests in the tree, uh, you know, tree protests to stop the trees being cut down for a bypass outside Reading. So all these sort of movements that were sort of happening in the 80s and the 90s and how the state sort of cracked down on them. And one of the things the police did is they sent it undercover uh, officers who basically uh, inserted themselves in these alternative communities and actually you know had relationships with with women in them and and you know sired children in them as part of their sort of um you know their their sort of undercover activity which is just you know completely you know morally dubious and what the book is is basically a battle between two corrupt policemen from different countries both involved in this sort of crackdown on revolutionary radical politics and I'm not going to say more than that because I don't want to spoil it it is a thriller there's a thriller element but it's superb I mean it's a good story in and of itself it has these high literary values that it uses to great effect I think but it's what you know it's a detective story that has the context of it's looking at revolutionary politics radical politics and the state response and the state uh, sort of clamp down and it's about corruption corrupted morals how far will individuals and the state go to you know gaining the the outcome that they want you know this this was terrific i really enjoyed this five stars and finally ali smith's autumn i'm going to do a dedicated video on this because i feel i can't give this a mark out of five um because it's part of her seasonal quartet it's the first one and I really feel I need to read the other three, uh, only one of them's out at the moment, which is Winter, which I've ordered, um, to be able to put this in context. Because so many of the questions I had arising from this book, I think can only be answered by what's in the other three. So um, I basically liked it, but I had a lot of questions. And if those questions get answered in a certain way, then maybe I won't. I'll end up not liking this book and what it was trying to do. Um, so I'm going to have to get back to you on this. Um, and that's Ali Smith, Autumn. So look out for uh, the future video on it. I haven't even recorded it yet. I'm going to do that straight after this one. So I can't post a link to it uh, as yet. So there you go. That was my uh, wrap up for the first two thirds of March. Uh, you know, if you want to say anything about any of those books, uh, please, you know, join in the conversation in the comments box. Um, and... You know, I've got some more books to read in March. I may end up recording another video uh, to take those in, uh, including Happy by Nicola Barker. So this is make or break uh, for me with Nicola Barker because I've read two of her books, Cauliflower and uh, Clear, and I didn't enjoy either of them. And I keep being told, you know, she's this really important experimental writer. She just won the Goldsmith Prize last year for experimental writing, beating people like Will Self. Uh, and I think Tony White also was on that list. Uh, but anyway, so I did not go out and buy this. Fortunately, a colleague at work um, had it and, and we've done a book swap, uh, not permanently. So she's reading uh, Carmen Maria Mercado's Her Body and Other Parties, which I've got a dedicated video on. Um, 
So I'm glad that I haven't had to pay for this because if I end up not liking it, apart from that's it for me and Nicola Barker, at least I haven't sort of shared out money for it. But I'm, you know, I'm interested to see if she wins me over. I don't think it's her fault that she's, you know, portrayed as this sort of radical, you know, writer, experimental writer, but I have not found her to be so. So this is, you know, this is, as I say, this is make or break. Is it, is it going to prove to me once and for all that, you know, she's a really exciting writer in my wheelhouse, which is experimental writing. So there you go. I'll, uh, I'll keep you posted on that. Till next time. Thanks very much.